Thank you for having me. It is a treat. Uh, and as I was saying in the uh, our little intro uh, before this became live, is it's really one of my first opportunities outside of the World Sleep Conferences to speak to an international audience. So I am uh, eager to get feedback from you and engage and learn uh, because it is a reciprocal process, and I'm I'm really glad to be included. And I saw the list of speakers who have already uh, spoken. I hope I don't repeat uh, any of like Dana or Carmela's content, uh, but I also think repetition is good. Uh, so, you know, if I do, uh, forgive me and we all add our own little twist. Um, I'm gonna start by sharing my slides and we'll see how well that works. Okay, it worked great. Okay, uh, and Anna, thank you for the introduction. Can you remind me, am I speaking for 45 minutes approximately and then half an hour or so of chatting? Yeah, Sounds about 45 good. minutes of talk and then we've got 15 minutes for questions actually. Okay, 15 minutes, okay. Um, I'll do my best. <laughs> I, I uh, gave a version of this talk a couple of weeks ago uh, at a meeting on disparities at, at the Brigham at Harvard and I tried to uh, double up by showing my work and some complimentary work by Mona Elsheik, who is awesome. And I was like, oh, I tried to cover way too much. So um, I want to say, I'm only going to focus on work from my primary project today. And, uh, but that's not to say there's, uh, it's the only relevant work out there. There's a whole uh, host of, you know, really interesting studies on adolescence and sleep health disparities. Um, I'll mention a little bit with a systematic review in the beginning, but for the most part, I um, only have time to focus on uh, some results from my study. Uh, so by way of introduction, I, uh, I like to tell people a little bit of my backstory uh, because some people might say, well, Lauren's a policy person. Why is she speaking at a sleep meeting or what, what's the deal? And I think it's really important to share that you know, sleep is an extremely interdisciplinary field. And I got into the field um, in 2002. Uh, I was getting my PhD in demography, which really has almost nothing to do directly with sleep, but I was interested in health disparities. And I attended a lecture at the University of Wisconsin uh, by Bob Stickgold, who then was uh, at Harvard doing experimental work on sleep and learning. And I'd never seen any work like that really in my life. I thought it was so cool. And then he ended his talk very casually in a room full of mostly psychologists. He ended by saying, and we don't really know very much about the demography of sleep. And that was in 2002. And you know, there was like a lightning hit me, and I just was like, "Oh, okay, uh, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, you know, look at any population-based data sets I can find and figure out what we know about what I've come to term the social patterning of of sleep health." Uh, and so I was 26 or 27 at the time. I you know chased him down at the airport the next day when I saw him. I told him my plan. You know, that was you know like this is what I'm going to do. Uh, and I'll also share that then I did go on and, you know, did these analyses. I had some interesting findings. I went, you know, kind of um, uh, boldly to sleep meetings where I often felt like I was uh, the odd man out. I was surrounded by circadian biologists and neuroscientists and you know, clinical psychologists. And I was like, nobody here is going to accept me. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, so, you know, that was kind of where I sat for a few years. I, and also I was really new in the field at all. Even was I even in the field? Uh, and, but I was finding things and I had access to some great data. So that helped. And I would be invited to present things. And at some point I presented at Brown and Mary Carskadden's lab. And she uh, and when I started, as I often did, I would start with this insecurity. I, you know, I'm not really trained in sleep, just like a little bit like what I already am doing right now, but I hope I've overcome my insecurity somewhat. And uh, a really important message that Mary gave to me was, uh, don't introduce yourself by what you're not. Tell people who you are and why you're there and what you can offer. So I, you know, that really helped me 
kind of embrace my background and my training. Um, and I hope you, you know, see that as a strength and, you know, see how we can be complementary in that way. And also carry it with you in your work because uh, it's better to, to talk about what you can offer rather than what you lack. So that's just good advice for all trainees. Uh, and then the follow-up story, which I love to share uh, because it's, it's so, uh, it just kind of captures the essence of Bob Stickle, who uh, is recently retired, I guess, um, or maybe not, he's still busy. But uh, in 2014, I had very little interaction with him during all this time that I got involved in sleep. And uh, I saw him at a meeting and he pointed at me and he, he said, uh, Madison. And, you know, I was like, oh, God, he thinks my name is Madison. You know, who, who is this guy? Uh, and he said, no, I know who I, I said, I'm Lauren Hale. And he said, I know who you are. Uh, I think about you all the time. And I was like, what? He said, I think about you because whenever I'm invited to give a talk, you're my reminder that you never know who you can inspire. And I just think that's so lovely. Um, I, it was so like shocking to me, but also kind of an important reminder that as you grow in your career and become, uh, you know, a creator of new information, it's our responsibility to go out and talk to other people in different fields to share what we found and, and you never know where it's going to lead to. So, you know, it wasn't just me doing um, disparities in sleep, but I was among the first people doing it. And I think it was triggered from a conversation that was, you know, he was on stage rambling in much the way that I'll probably do today. And I, I can't promise to inspire any of you in the way that I was inspired, but, but perhaps. And if so, please let me know if something I said um, changes the way that you view anything or research that you do in the future, because uh, I know that, that Bob is delighted that I have uh, had the, my career shaped by his remarks. And I would love to know of any, any work that is inspired, especially internationally. Like, as I was saying earlier, it's just not something um, that I'm that familiar with. And I'd love to hear what's going on uh, in Europe or, or elsewhere related to disparities in, in sleep health. Um, so please let's stay in touch. Uh, please, you know, consider me a friendly face. Um, and today I'll mostly be talking about um, Adolescence, uh, disparities in adolescence. And it's not where I started. I started looking at uh, disparities in adult sleep. I also wanted to throw out that I have a, a range of affiliations beyond Stony Brook. All of these four are uh, voluntary affiliations, although I was uh, compensated when I was the uh, founding editor in chief of Sleep Health, which is the National Sleep Foundation's uh, uh, sleep journal first public health journal committed to sleep. Uh, and I've been on the board of these other organizations. I'm happy to talk about them. The theme running through all of them is that I'm interested in translating uh, the science of uh, what we know about sleep health to what happens in the real world. And that uh, is not always easy. So you got to get involved. And I hope uh, you have ways to get involved as well. Okay, I know I ramble. My apologies, but I think that story is worth it. Um, this is the, a standard disclosure. I have NIH funding, some private funding, and various honoraria. Um, I don't think anything I, I'm saying is in conflict, but um, it is relevant to some of the uh, people I get funding from. Uh, here is the general schedule for what we're doing today. Uh, I have one new slide <laughs> that I made yesterday uh, called What is Juneteenth? So you'll see that next. Uh, you may not know. Uh, and then I'll go into kind of uh, my more standard slide deck of what I like to talk about, uh, which is a theme I, I will repeat again and again, which is sleep health is a social justice issue. Uh, then I'll focus in on two systematic reviews about uh, pediatric sleep equity, one on younger kids and one on older kids. I was a co-author on both of those. And then I'll finally uh, dive into some empirical data 
I don't know how many studies I'll present, somewhere between eight and 12, let's say. Uh, but, you know, what, one to two slides each study. So you're, it's, it's breadth rather than depth we're getting, but we're getting it all from the same uh, longitudinal data set. It's called the Future of Families. And I'll give you a little bit more information about that um, really rich cohort data. And, and then I'll conclude. And hopefully we will be on time. Okay, so let's talk about Juneteenth. Do I have a way of seeing hands uh, when I do this? Can you guys tell me if you've ever heard of Juneteenth? Uh, yes, we have several. Okay, but not a huge amount, but that, it's okay. You don't have to. Oh, I see some thumbs up. Uh, well, I will confess that I selected this date not knowing that it was Juneteenth when I selected it many months ago uh, because it's a relatively recent federal holiday in the U.S. President Biden made this holiday uh, official only two years ago. It's kind of the first new federal holiday in nearly 40 years. So we don't get federal holidays very often. Uh, but it's an important holiday because it commemorates uh, the end of slavery. And the date for the end of slavery was June 19th, 1865, when nearly 250,000 slaves were uh, informed that the Civil War had ended uh, because the Union troops arrived in Galveston, Texas and let them know. But if you know anything about American history, you'll say, that doesn't make sense. The Civil War ended in 1863. It took two and a half years <laughs> for slavery to actually end, uh, but, it, but it finally did. And it is indeed, uh, uh, you know, something to remember and commemorate. Uh, of course, it's also, I think, appropriate that I'm going to be speaking today about uh, racial disparities. Most of what I talk about today is racial disparities in sleep, but all of this rests on the context of uh, widespread discrimination, you know, stemming from centuries of oppression and slavery, and then kind of lasting consequences of uh, structural and covert um, uh, discrimination in everyday life. And it's relevant to sleep because this everyday discrimination that happens, whether it's in a grocery store while you're shopping, in the classroom by how the teachers treat some students differently, uh, whether it happens on the job market or in the real estate market leading to res residential segregation or in the doctor's office or in the healthcare system, all of these various levels of discrimination lead to a heightened sense of vigilance. And that vigilance is, I would say, the primary pathway through which uh, we might see uh, or we probably see uh, disparities in sleep health. There are other pathways too, and I'm going to be talking about it, but this, this heightened vigilance is, is very important. Uh, so in, in some ways, I'm happy to be speaking on uh, Juneteenth um, about this topic and happy to be talking to an audience that may not be familiar with the holiday, even though I think even in the U.S., it's it's really um, not widely recognized yet either. It turns out it's inconvenient for me because I have two kids home from school because in New York, where I live, they don't have school on Juneteenth, but not every every state has the same policies. Uh, so uh, anyway, th I, I'm just glad to get a few words in about the importance of uh, Juneteenth and American history when we talk about disparities. Uh, so let's zero in or uh, focus on the topic of interest, which is uh, sleep health. And sleep health is a social justice issue. And that's the message that I have kind of uh, kept ringing <laughs> for over a decade or, or more. Uh, and there are three tenets on why uh, sleep health is more than just a public health problem. And, and here's what they are. Uh, these are going to be familiar to many of you, but I think it's important to have them all on one slide so that you're you understand why social why we can call it a social justice issue. The first is that poor sleep health is prevalent uh, and is kind of like late to the game in the in the eyes of public health officials. Uh, there, you know, whether it's smoking or physical activity, nutrition, sleep kind of 
only more recently became recognized as a public health problem. And if we're talking about teens, which I am for this talk, uh, it's you know 50 to 70% of American teens are not getting the recommended eight to 10 hours per night. So that, you know, if it were just this bullet point alone, sleep health would be a public health problem. But it's a social justice problem because of the next two bullet points. And that is the second one is that sleep health is unequally distributed. And that is sort of the main story. You'll get that in you know, the next few slides, uh, but also the why of that may be in, in the rest of the presentation as well. Sleep is unequally distributed early in life up through adulthood. And uh, to me, this, this is unfair. If there's a time when we should all be getting the same thing, it should be when we're sleeping. Um, and finally, the third reason is sleep is linked to adverse uh, social and health outcomes. And again, this audience is already familiar with the wide range of physical health, uh, psychological well-being outcomes, cognitive functioning, and uh, public safety outcomes that are related to poor sleep. So, you know, this is the trifecta of why sleep health is a social justice issue, and we need to be concerned about it. So, What's the story here? I'm gonna call upon kind of the ideas of my colleague and uh, friend, Wendy Troxell, who you know, studies sleep in the dyad. And she says, you know, sleep is often considered an individual and a biological experience. And that makes a lot of sense because we, we often do it alone. It's driven by your circadian biology. Um, we do it in the dark. You know, you're not talking during. There's all sorts of reasons why it makes sense that the public uh, and many clinicians might think, well, this is an individual behavior. Um, but I hope uh, many of you who work in this area understand, of course, uh, whether from your own personal life or from your uh, professional experience, that what you experience during the day, whether it's in your classroom or on the job or on the bus, uh, you carry it with you and you carry it into your bedroom and you carry it on, onto your pillow. And then also what's happening in your bedroom is related to all of those factors as well, whether there's another person there, whether it's light outside or noisy or what hours you work, all of these things make it decidedly not an individual experience because it's embedded in this social context. And many of you have seen various versions of the socio-ecological uh, model of sleep. This is one lovely version that, that Wendy shared with me and is related, similar to one we published in a, a manuscript. Uh, and the idea is that especially when you think of all of these kind of layers of experience, individual, household, community policy embedded in the background of systemic racism, the consequences for disparities are really meaningful. So as I go through the layers of this onion today, which is, is what I plan to do with various uh, empirical results, um, I'll always be thinking that well, how is, is this different? How do school start times vary uh, by uh, whether you're a minority or not? How does uh, exposure to uh, safe and trusting neighborhoods vary by who you are and where you're able to buy a home? All of those things matter. Uh, so just be thinking of this image as we go through. Also look at the little icon in the middle. I tried to do this, it's not always perfect, but um, if it's a green icon on the upper right of each slide, that means I'm talking at the individual level. Sometimes I have the purple icon, sometimes the yellow icon, sometimes the red icon. Uh, you'll see the goal of this talk is not to teach you any single number or you know mat effect size, but rather to highlight that there's evidence that the effects of social and contextual factors occur at all levels. And we need to be thinking outside of just the individual experience. So let's go in. I'm going to just very quickly, I know I talk so long. Um, <laughs> I'm going to very quickly review two lit reviews. Um, I was, as I said, I was a co-author on both, but the bulk of the work was always done by the first author. In this case, it's Jonathan Smith at Yale. And he, um, just, just one slide on a, review from a few years ago 
on what are the what's the evidence for uh, racial differences in sleep among preschool age kids, two to five year olds. To me, one of the most interesting things about his study is that he only found nine studies, and we only looked in the U.S., so you know that that might be relevant, but um, that's because of Americans' history with slavery, we wanted to focus just on the U.S. experience. Uh, but the bottom line is he found pretty consistent uh, differences um, in bedtime routines. Uh, white children tend to have earlier bedtime routines, uh, more routines, and higher odds of using bedtimes than Hispanic and Black children in the U.S. White children tend to have longer nocturnal sleep um, and uh, slightly less napping. Uh, I think that's one of the interesting findings from this uh, Crosby study is that at older ages, uh, napping is more common among uh, Black children due to uh, presumably less nocturnal sleep among the Black children. So uh, that's early life. Let's move on to, um, I think I might have, oh yeah. Uh, the second lit review by Dana Guglielmo et al., looked at a wider age range, school rate, school age, and adolescent kids. And this only found 23 studies. There, there are probably more now because um, it's about five years ago. Uh, but again, they found consistent findings that uh, Hispanic, Black, and Asian teens sleep less than white teens. Um, Self-reported and parent-reported data show these effects a little bit bigger than the actigraphy-based studies. Uh, when this lit review was done, there were only three activity-based studies um, done. Two were uh, community-based samples in Pittsburgh and Cleveland. And then the third by James et al. Was with my data, it's a national study. And we found that the magnitude of the differences was, was between 20 and 30 minutes per night. Uh, that's a big difference. To me, 20 to 30 minutes per night is pretty meaningful. Um, and we also have found that Hispanic teens interestingly sleep um, longer than black teens. So that's the evidence on um, sleep duration. Uh, there's also evidence that um, sleep efficiency is lower among black adolescents uh, with higher uh, fragmentation. Insomnia symptoms are more variable, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about that right now. So that's the background. Let's go in and see what I was able to do with my data. And this data set, I have to attribute, uh, these are extremely rich data set. It was not developed to study sleep at all. It was designed by uh, a family demographer at Princeton University, it happened to be started while I was in graduate school in the same department while I was in graduate school, but I was not working with this professor at all. Her name is Sarah McClanahan, and uh, unfortunately, she passed away a few years ago, uh, but the study lives on. We had a workshop uh, featuring the latest wave of the survey, the data collection, uh, just last week at Columbia um, in the same building where Carmela Alcantara speaks, uh, uh, works, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a small world. Even though the U.S. is big, we overlap in lots of ways. Um, and kind of one of the richness of the study is that they captured, they enrolled participants at birth within 48 hours, often less than 48 hours of when a mother gave birth. <laughs> they entered, field investigators went to hospitals in these 20 cities, enrolled 5,000 participants and got the parents involved, the children involved, and then they followed them for years. We're still following them at ages um, one, three, five, nine, 15. We're wrapping up data collection on age 22 now, and we've already got a grant submitted, not me in particular, but the larger study for data collection age 27. So you can see this is an extremely unusual uh, data collection, and it's very hard to track these people. We still don't have all 4,800 participants, but, and the other thing is it was um, oversampled for non-resident fathers, Black and Hispanic mothers, and parents with uh, low education. You may have heard of this study called the Fragile Families Study, but we recently changed, I didn't, but the um, PIs of the study recently changed the name to the Future of Families uh, 
for a range of reasons, but from now on, it's, it's still FF. You might just see this little FF logo in the corner. Whenever you see that, you'll know that I'm using, uh, I'm referring to data from these studies. Um, I want to jump ahead to the age 15 study because I, I see I'm already running late on time. Uh, but before I got funded to collect actigraphy data on the age 15 study, I wanted to go into the parent reported data at ages three and five, where we did have some measures on bedtime routines and sleep outcomes. And this is one of the studies that was cited in the um, first systematic lit review showing indeed that uh, white children and children more educated uh, mothers had more regular bedtimes and that language-based bedtime routines like reading, singing, or saying a prayer together was associated not only with longer sleep duration, um, but better cognitive outcomes um, at age five. So more routines at age three uh, with better outcomes at age five. And then um, perhaps not surprisingly for those of you interested in screens, uh, we did find that television watching, remember this was in 2000 before we had um, tablets and things, uh, was associated with um, increased aggression at, at later waves. So, you know. so that's some of the early data. Uh, at age nine, again, we only had parent reported data on sleep. Uh, we flipped it to rather than predicting short sleep, we wanted to predict who's getting sufficient sleep. And again, we found disparities such that black children were about 60% less likely to be getting a nine or more hours per night at age nine. Um, Hispanic children about 30% less likely um, and other race, ethnicity, even, even larger gaps. So. We also found some protective features. Um, children of foreign born mothers uh, were more likely to get um, sufficient sleep. And again, there was a benefit of education and uh, marriage household structure on, on sleep duration. So, you know, there's lots of things that could be going on there, uh, but I just want to set the stage for delving into the age 15 data. Oh. We're not quite ready for the age 15 data. Um, age nine data, we also found this very consistent finding that uh, kids whose mothers, uh, like I would say above and beyond the racial and demographic differences in sleep, the thing that mattered most at, even after adjustment for race was that having early and consistent enforcement of bedtime routines was most positively, positively associated with sufficient sleep. I think this is like extremely reassuring, wonderful news because this is a modifiable health behavior. It's not always easy for parents, including my own myself, to have and enforce an early bedtime routine that was before 9 p.m. That's how we coded it. Um, but it is effective and, and that's reassuring. There are structural reasons why it might not be doable uh, in all households, but I, I like this as like, look, the evidence is um, having these routines is effective. And the consequences for child health, um, also somewhat interesting, is that we found uh, better uh, odds of excellent health or higher probability of excellent health among uh, kids who got more sleep, uh, generally in the 9 to 11 hours range uh, for kids. But if the parents were reporting the excellent sleep, the more sleep, the better. I think that's because the parents had that extra time to recoup themselves or do what they needed to do. Okay, so that's it on age nine. Let's go up to age 15, which was really kind of the beginning of my uh, more involvement in actual data collection. All those other things were collected before I got involved. And this was the conceptual model that we wrote in 2012. So this is kind of old school, but it captures what we were looking for. We wanted to see what are the determinants of sleep at age 15 and what were the consequences or the outcomes? Uh, and we were concerned about the moderating or modifiable roles of both physical activity and screen time. So with this in mind, you don't need to remember anything specifically, especially the AIM numbers. Uh, let's go into some of the data, see what we collected and, and what we found. Oh, and I have the old name here. I didn't update it. It should be now called the Future of Families Sleep Sub-Study. My apologies. So at age 15, there were about 3,600 3, primary caregivers who were interviewed. Um, and 
similar amount of teens, age approximately at age 15, uh, we got saliva samples on around 2,300. I'm not presenting any of those results today, but uh, some people are, are using that data. And then for a subsample of the 3,400 teens, we sent field investigators to the homes uh, to do the survey, it, to the, do the interview and saliva collection in person, and also to measure body mass index, and also to distribute activity actigraphy devices. And in addition to the distribution of devices, we let them know about the daily diary, which at the time now, because we, we're doing it at age 22 as well, and now we do it on a smartphone, but this was in like 2014, they had to log on to a computer um, through an authenticated password and uh, use basically a Qualtrics-based survey to fill out a daily diary every day. So what we were collecting was a survey at one point in time, age, the age 15 survey, which had some questions about sleep, a daily diary, which I'll show on the next slide or two, and uh, two actigraph devices. Um, here's when we collected the data uh, between February of 2014 and February of 2016. Most, we started with just a few cities and then built up to all 20 cities. Um, here, what we got, we had the people, uh, participants wear the devices for seven days. Most of them wore the devices six, seven, or eight days, but some ran a little long and some had invalid days, unfortunately. Um, and then the scoring was led by our trusty actigraphy uh, center uh, at Penn State or Fayo Buxton and Emory Chang. If you don't know them, you should get to know them. And uh, our primary variables of interest are sleep duration, sleep quality, and sleep timing. Uh, you'll see as I get to the results, uh, which ones we focus on at different points. And I think I don't need to present these slides, but we had this device on the wrist for measuring sleep. And we had this device on the hip for measuring physical activity. And you might say, why are you using both? And because we believe that those were the best uh, validated devices for each of those um, outcomes. So we doubled up and that makes our data extra rich. Um, and then what did we collect in the daily diary? They logged onto a website called Teens in Motion and we asked them questions about their sleep, about their daily activities, about what they did in the hour before bed, uh, about what they had eaten in the previous day, and a range of other questions, including mood, family interactions, social interactions, and one question about experience discrimination. So uh, it's a lot of data and we're still analyzing it. We, we're, we're almost done with collecting the age 22 data and we're still writing papers with the age 15. Uh, so I don't think I'm showing you all of the papers today, but I will run you through a bunch of the results uh, to give you kind of the gist of, of the story. And we are in the process of scoring the age 22 data right now. We have finished collecting um, and hopefully we'll be able to start analyzing the data in, in the fall, if maybe sooner, we'll see. So let's start with the kind of the big question was, well, what did we see about racial and uh, ethnic differences in sleep? Uh, after adjustment for all the standard covariates, we very clearly found that black teens were sleeping about 32 minutes uh, less per weeknight and 41 minutes less per weekend night than, than white teens. To me, this, this was, quite large and kind of alarming. You know, it was it was bigger than some of the other findings from the, the Spillsbury study and the Matthews study, which were about 20 minutes. Uh, but we had data on napping and that was pretty interesting because what we found is that there was presumably compensatory napping during the day to kind of make up that gap. So when you looked at 24 hour sleep, that gap, uh, was not statistically significant. It was still uh, less, but not enough to reach significance. So I, th I think that's a pretty interesting finding. Uh, but there was a consistent finding with uh, more social jet lag, about 20 minutes uh, long, longer in Black teens or higher in Black teens compared to white teens. And I'll come up with some 
present, I'll come, I'll present in a few slides about uh, what we've shown in our data, what social jet lag is linked to. I'm sure you have other information on that as well. So, yeah, so let's start with one of our favorite topics, uh, which is uh, screen use, sleep, and well being. This first study that I'm presenting has the benefit of having around you know, 3,000 participants because we relied solely on survey data. This was uh, my postdoc at the time, Stella Lee, did this analysis before we had the actigraphy data in. Uh, but we were interested in understanding uh, the link between screen time and depression, uh, depressive symptoms, and whether we saw sleep kind of mediating or explaining why we see this um, higher association. And just so you know, in case you're not following, why would you be? The Surgeon General of the US recently had an advisory about the link between social media and depression among kids. So this is a national issue. It's a worldwide issue. We're concerned. Uh, is you know social media bringing us down, quite literally? Um, and uh, what's... As a sleep person, I want to know what's the role of sleep in that, and is there a way you can use that knowledge to intervene, just to to use your social media, but in a way that doesn't interfere with sleep. And what we found is that for almost every measure of screen time, we had four different categories of screen time: uh, video gaming, social media, messaging, and streaming. I think, or whatever television. Uh, there was at least partial, but often full mediation by these uh, three sleep variables, problems falling asleep, uh, staying asleep, and shorter sleep duration. And this was even after adjustment or controlling for the earlier waves uh, depressive symptoms. So it's not that the pre-existing uh, depressed kids, uh, the de depression that was pre-existing caused greater screen use or sleep problems. It was, you know, all is equal with depressive level. Uh, the higher screen use uh, was linked with worse sleep and worse uh, depressive scores at age 15. So we thought this was a pretty important finding. Uh, David Reichenberger, who just defended his dissertation uh, last week, um, got into the actigraphy data and I would really love him to present in this forum uh, someday, uh, maybe soon. Uh, and he showed quite clearly that um, between people, the use of these kind of more interactive forms of screen use, um, email and text, social messaging, video games uh, were uh, associated with later sleep onset times, uh, whereas the more passive forms of screen use were not associated with um, later sleep onset, and neither is reading, which is not a screen use. Um, uh, this was a slightly different question about what were you doing these activities in the hour before bed, or how, how much of the time were you doing it um, between you know, zero and 60 minutes or something. So uh, more use was associated again with later sleep onset. As I said, I want to acknowledge that David Regenberger is now a PhD. He defended his dissertation last week. I just pulled this lovely picture, happy picture of him from Twitter. Um, and he is, his research uh, that he presented his dissertation was not from uh, fragile families. That's something he's, or future families, but it's something that I think he would love to present or talk to you guys about um, looking at uh more experimental studies on light emitting device on sleep health. So, and he and I are involved right now in a consensus panel. I'm chairing it. He's one of the lieutenants. Uh, uh, National Sleep Foundation is doing an international consensus panel on what's the role of screen time on sleep. So maybe he should come back and talk about um, screens explicitly, whereas I'm just throwing it in there as one of the one of the many ways in which individual level behaviors affect sleep of teens. Okay, so that's at the individual level. We're sticking to the individual level. Um, so screen was the first one. The second individual level factor, which is important to talk about, is physical activity. And this study was conducted by our project manager, Lindsay Master, who's just fantastic. She's been with the study for a long time. And remember, we had daily, we have daily levels of physical activity 
as well as daily levels of uh, sleep uh, in 640 teens. We lose people as we as we collect more data. You don't have the richness in every single uh, person, but and uh, the result I want to focus on is this paper has been published is in the top right of panel one. Uh, the role of uh, physical activity, moderate to vigorous physical activity, on that night's sleep outcomes, and what you see is that more minutes during the day of physical activity was associated with. Uh, with within person, so it's it's stronger than the between people um, studies uh, within person um, on nights when on days when you exercise more, you have a slightly earlier bedtime, longer sleep duration, and higher sleep maintenance efficiency. So really nice solid finding about the benefits of physical activity on sleep health. Uh, this is another individual level factor done by my current postdoc and wonderful colleague, uh, Gina Matthew, uh, looking at within person, what's the reported use of caffeine on um, sleep outcomes, and perhaps not surprisingly, that more caffeine consumption within person on days when you consume caffeine, bedtime is later, as well as wake time is later in teens, um, which I, I'm always surprised that the wake time can be later because of um, the constraint of school start time, but there's a little bit of wiggle room, I guess. Uh, so, oh, I already did this slide, but that's okay. Let's move from the individual to the household level. This slide is a little inappropriate because I wanna be only focusing on age 15 at this point, but you'll see that obviously parent routines related, parent led routines are related to um, adolescent outcomes or not a nine-year-old outcomes, um, but our next question was, well, how long do those um, parent-led routines last? And Sumi Lee, who's now in Florida, asked this question by doing some latent uh, class analysis to say, well, let's group all of the individuals in the survey based on their routine, their family routines at ages five and nine. And as you can see, there were some groups, about 7% of the sample, had no routines at age five, about 11% of the sample had no routines at age nine. And then the rest of the sample was somewhere between borderline or appropriate bedtime routines. And of course, group four in green, green is go, uh, was the best well off. Well, let's see if what group you were in based on age five and nine, nothing to do with your age 15 routines, um, predicts some outcomes at age 15 and this paper has been published in Sleep, what you see just goes straight over to the last um, column. Group four is the one that has the longest self-report of sleep duration, the longest actigraphic report of sleep duration, and the lowest body mass index. And this is all based on what your parents' bedtime routine and an adjustment for other covariates as well. Um, but the main predictor here is what your parents' bedtime routines were at ages five and nine. So I think you know, this tells a story that the routines that are established earlier in life may have a lasting effect on both um, health and sleep. Okay, so that this is the housing order. Uh, we're still looking at the house level. Uh, we had several questions about family interaction quality. Uh, and again, within person, we're able to say on days when you had positive interactions uh, with your family, how does that relate to sleep? On days when you had positive interactions, all else equal, 26 minutes more sleep. That's a really large magnitude of more sleep related to your own self. You're getting more sleep. And conversely, if there's more stress, more family stress, this is related to lower sleep quality, self-reported sleep quality. So one, the top um, bullet point was based on act actigraphy. Second bullet point was based on self-report. Uh, another very interesting finding that hasn't been published, but Sarah James did this analysis when she was looking at the uh, uh, racial differences in sleep data. The survey interviewers, remember they went to the homes and they um, were interviewing people for an hour, an hour and a half, depending on how how much they had to do. 
And they took notes on whether or not the household was kind of a chaotic environment. In particular, they counted the number of interruptions, whether dogs were barking, televisions were on, phone calls and doors were knocked on, that type of thing. And Sarah was able to count how many interruptions were reported by the field investigator. And the cut point she found was at three or more interruptions, all else equal, adjusting for uh, uh, race, ethnicity, adjusting for um, sex. Uh, we found that households where there are a lot of interruptions was to say with 21 minutes less sleep per night. So a, a lot seems to matter about the context of what's going on in the home. Also interesting is there are questions about perceived household chaos, and we did not find an effect of perception of household chaos, but when a field investigator is keeping track, uh, that did predict uh, sleep outcomes. So kind of surprising. Let's move up to the community level, not just the household, but at the community. We were able to link all of our data because we had national data, uh, we could link it to census tracts and we had a wide range of census tracts. And the census, you can create an indicator of disadvantage based on, uh, not on race, ethnicity, because that would be endogenous, but based on uh, uh, factors like employment and income and things like that. And this is a standard uh, measure of social dis or neighborhood disadvantage. And here we found that more disadvantaged neighbors, uh, neighborhoods, individuals in more disadvantaged had more WASO, to me, not a huge difference, but four minutes more WASO per night and lower sleep maintenance efficiency. So consistent with the story that neighborhoods also contribute to sleep health. Oh my God, we're going late on time. Um, now my favorite topic, I already talked with Anna at the start before this began, is uh, here's the result from both actigraphic and self-reported uh, wake time and sleep time data uh, to show that the only kids, first of all, there's a monotonic rise. Uh, the later your school starts, the more time you spend in bed, which is the square um, and or the circle and your actigraphic sleep also goes up accordingly. And the only uh, participants who had an average actigraphic time above seven and a half, really, it's not even the recommended eight to 10, were those who had school start times at 8.30 a.m. or later, uh, which is uh, the recommendation, at least in the U.S., by all the existing uh, medical organizations about what time school should start. For those of you who aren't following this topic closely in the U.S., uh, the state of California uh, passed legislation after many years of uh, failed attempts or multiple years of failed attempts uh, to require all secondary schools, high schools to start at 8.30 or later and middle schools to start at 8 a.m. or later. They're in the process of implementing this now. All eyes are on California. Uh, the state of Florida, just a month or two ago, passed legislation that's very similar. Politically, those states are very different, but the fact that they're coming together and issuing this policy is a really promising sign for sleep health. And other states have uh, legislation in the works, but there's also a lot of pushback, and I understand uh, the pushback is worldwide on changes in start times. Uh, just a few other topics. Uh, one thing that's very important about uh, school start time is that if the weekday school start times are too early, um, and then you have the uh, phase delay for teens, what you often get is a, a social jet lag where they're going to bed too late on the weekends. And, and, and then by the time Monday rolls around, they have a big social jet lag. And some of Gina's work, this is actually three papers shelved into one um, slide, uh, greater social jet lag in our age 15 sample was associated with uh, both more anxious symptoms and more depressive symptoms, as well as more unhealthy eating behaviors and higher body mass index. So whole range of outcomes related to, I would say, the later school start time issue. Uh, and again, she's also found that um, greater variability in uh, sleep among the teens is linked with a higher rate of uh, failing grades, which is in the US is a D or, or lower, and um, a lower rate of uh, getting A's. And not sure what your grading systems are. So my apologies if that makes no sense to you, but better grades with more regular sleep. 
is the bottom line. And I think that's basically it. My my conclusions, I'm just going to throw up there, uh, are that sleep disparities are pronounced and consistent. And I hope I've conveyed uh, in a range of ways that the underlying disparities uh, take place at many levels, not just at the individual level, like you might assume, but at the home, neighborhood, and policy levels. And the goal is to work in an interdisciplinary way with uh, stakeholders to kind of create uh, interventions that are culturally sensitive and target these upstream determinants so that we can all get better sleep and be healthier. And I think I'm going to end there. I don't, I think that's it. Oh, this is the most important slide. This is a, a giant collaborative uh, effort. And I love all my colleagues and thank them so much for uh, working on it with me because it's really been fun. So there we are.